Hello, everyone. Uh, thank everyone for joining us today for the third in a series of Western Governors Species Conservation and Endangered Species Act Initiative webinars. Today's webinar is titled, The Role of Conflict and Litigation in the ESA. My name is Zach Bodain, Policy Advisor for Wildlife and Lands at the Western Governors Association. I'd like to start off um, by first saying that if anyone is in need of technical assistance, please message Amy Schweig through the WebEx application or call WGA at 303-623-9378. Before I introduce our moderator and panelists, I'd like to take a moment to describe the Western Governor's Species Conservation and Endangered Species Act initiative and go over a few logistical details for the webinar. The Western Governor's Species Conservation and ESA Initiative is the chairman's initiative of Wyoming Governor Matt Mead. Through the initiative, WJ hopes to create a framework for states to share best practices in species management, promote and elevate the role of states in species conservation efforts, and explore ways to improve the efficacy and efficiency of the Endangered Species Act. The initiative will involve an examination of the ESA to determine what's working and what isn't, but the effort, however, will go beyond just a consideration of the ESA and examine and highlight innovations related to species management and species conservation and consider means by which state resources can be better leveraged. I'd like to go over a few logistical details quickly. Today we're joined by our moderator, Michael Brennan, Director of the Wildlife Conservation and Mitigation Program at the Texas A&M Institute for Renewable Natural Resources. The panelists will introduce themselves just a moment before their opening remarks. Each panelist will deliver brief opening remarks, and following those, Michael asks a few questions of the panelists to begin our moderated discussion. Following the moderated discussion amongst panelists, we'll have an open question and answer session open to all attendees. All general attendees are currently on mute, so please write your questions in the chat box on the bottom right and be sure that you have selected the option to directly address your chat question to me, Zach Bodain. Our goal is to have a recording of the webinar available uh, tomorrow afternoon, Friday the 26th. And again, I'd like to say that if anyone is in need of technical assistance, please message Amy Schweig through the WebEx app or call WGA at 303-623-9378. With all that being said, I'd like to hand things over to our moderator. Mike? Mike, you there? Hey, Mike, we can't Are hear you. you now? Yep, we can hear you now. All right, thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, worked just fine 30 minutes ago. Anyway, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. We have an outstanding group of panelists today. Um, truly outstanding with, with deep expertise and experience in, in the Endangered Species Act. Uh, rather than waste your time, I want to move right to the panelists so that they have as much time as possible to share their initial remarks. Uh, I'll introduce the succeeding panelists once the initial panelist presentation is concluded. I'd like to start off uh, by welcoming Lisa Reynolds. Lisa is an Assistant Attorney General for the state of Colorado. She represents the Colorado Department of Natural Resources on Endangered Species Issues in negotiations and litigation, both under the Endangered Species Act. Her clients include Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the Colorado Water Conservation Board. She works with local governments and stakeholders as well, as well as with other Western states in cultivating and uh, encouraging innovative approaches to species conservation. Prior to joining the AG, Lisa worked in private practice as a litigator at Arnold and Porter and subsequently at the firm of Kaplan, Kirsch, and Rockwell in Denver. Her background includes work service as an assistant professor of political science at Arizona State. She graduated from the University of Colorado Law School and the University of California at San Diego and Dartmouth College. So, Lisa, good morning. Thank you for being with us, and the stage is yours. Thanks, Mike, and good morning, everybody. Um, as Mike said, um, I'm an assistant attorney general for the state of Colorado, and on behalf of the state, I really want to thank WGA and Governor Mead for sponsoring this initiative. We're, we're really excited about it, and we think that it's, it's yielded some really interesting discussions so far. Um, I want to first tell you a little bit about my position here to give you some context on our state's perspective on, on ESA litigation. 
My principal client, as Mike said, is Colorado Department of Natural Resources, along with one of its divisions, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, I, I do represent the Water Conservation Board as well, particularly when they're uh, looking at rivers that have endangered fish in them. Um, I was hired to fill a position as specifically as ESA counsel to DNR. Um, a couple of states now have full-time ESA counsel. In addition to Colorado, Alaska, and Utah are the ones I'm familiar with. There might be others. Um, but it seems to be a trend that's increasing. My position was created by the legislature in 2014 at the request of DNR because ESA issues had become more and more front and center and uh, resource consuming for the department. Uh, can I have the next slide? Um, this was partly due to the MDL deadline suit settlement agreement. Close to a dozen Colorado species were part of that settlement. As you can see here, within the span of just two years, we had seven listing decisions that affected Colorado species. Three of them came out not warranted. The greater sage grouse there at the bottom, as probably everyone on this call knows, was not warranted. Um, three threatened and one endangered. Um, and of those, litigation has already been brought for four of them uh, under the ESA, under greater sage grouse. Um, it's not ESA litigation, but activities that revolve around the not warranted decision have been challenged. Um, and we expect that when Western Yellow Bill's Cuckoo Critical Habitat is designated, there will be litigation there. And there's been a 60-day letter filed, uh, notice of intent for Rio Grande cutthroat trout, although there hasn't been a complaint yet. So conceivably, every one of those seven species um, we could see litigation on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and among those seven, Colorado is the only state that had all three of the grouse species that were in the MDL settlement, um, the lesser prairie chicken, the Gunnison sage grouse, and the greater sage grouse, all of which were, as you know, very controversial uh, and, and very time consuming for us. Next slide. We have others still on deck. Um, the boreal toad and the white-tailed ptarmigan down in the right-hand corner both have had positive 90-day findings and are under review. The Rio Grande Chub and the Rio Grande Sucker, that's the sucker on the top right, we expect positive 90-day findings next month. And then the Arkansas Darter down on the left is another MDL candidate species um, with a deadline coming up. Next slide. We also have ongoing issues with management and recovery of already listed species in our state. This is just a few of them. Um, we have an experimental population of black-footed ferret. We have a reintroduced population of Canada lynx. The Colorado pike minnow is part of uh, a major recovery implementation program that spans the whole upper basin of the Colorado River. Uh, and then Mexican wolf, there's currently some recovery planning going on right now. Um, and one of the proposals that's been floated would involve uh, introducing Mexican wolves to Colorado. So those are some of the things we have going on in addition to listings. Uh, next slide, please. So even before this spate of activity, Colorado DNR and CPW were focused on conservation efforts, as most state wildlife agencies are, for species that they had identified as being in need of attention. But we've devoted even more resources lately to pre-listing conservation efforts. We have projects, um, uh, scientific data collection, analysis, conservation agreements with stakeholders and local governments for pretty much every one of those species that you saw still under consideration, and obviously for um, management and recovery of the existing listed ones. Um, so our ESA plate is pretty full, but I want to point out that when the state created my position, they located it in the Attorney General's office because what they really felt they needed was somebody with the legal expertise to navigate the ESA from that perspective and to engage in litigation as necessary to protect the state's interests because, as I showed you in that first slide, um, it's becoming more and more of an issue for Colorado specifically. Um, so our interest is really twofold. In addition to directly protecting our state interests in listing and critical habitat designation, new rules promulgated by the agencies, 
DNR and CPW really want to be able to move forward with the kinds of partnerships and conservation projects that have already worked for us. Um, and they feel like they want to be positioned to defend these activities if necessary when they're challenged, to take on federal agencies that might put up impediments um, to realizing some of these agreements. And so in our view, ESA has really opened up some avenues that might not have otherwise been there. Um, for example, the MDL decision deadlines, while nobody wants to operate under a deadline, um, those things can also provide an impetus to getting agreements um, finalized, to getting funding, and to really getting efforts off the ground. Um, next slide, please. Um, and we have jumped in, too. We're a plaintiff in um, the Gunnison Sage. We've challenged the Gunnison Sagegrass listing, which we thought, after significant conservation successes, uh, was not warranted for listing. Um, at the same time, we are also involved in partnerships with uh, NRCS and the Sagegrass Initiative and local governments to continue addressing conservation and to, um, you know, be looking at areas where we think the species uh, could be helped. Um, and so one of our questions has been the extent to which we can continue partnerships and collaboration while litigation is ongoing, but also whether litigation can be used to foster new kinds of innovations, new tools, um, and new avenues that will lead towards more successful conservation efforts with more broadly based support, which is where we have seen successes in the state of Colorado. And so I guess one of the, the questions that we're most interested in right now in exploring is, is whether litigation can be used to provide the same kind of impetus towards significant conservation gains and recovery as it has in the past in listing and critical habitat designation disputes and um, statutory interpretation. So I'm just going to leave that there, Mike, and um, uh, answer questions as they come up. Grizzly bears, piping plovers, pig males, red knots, and other imperiled species. Um, he has experience in wetlands and other sorts of litigation as well. Prior to joining the Defenders, he served as Litigation and Policy Counsel for Community Rights uh, and as an associate at the law firm of Perkins Coie. Before going to law school, he worked as a conservationist at the Conservation Fund and the National Wildlife Federation. He has a BA in government cum laude from Cornell University and got his JD from the William and Mary School of Law. Jason, you're up. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, it looks like uh, the slide presentation may not be exactly as I sent it, so maybe something was lost in email translation. So uh, it looks like uh, colors and other things are off. But anyway, we'll continue. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to participate uh, in this uh, workshop and to have a discussion with some outstanding uh, panelists and practitioners uh, in this field. And if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, from our perspective, the Endangered Species Act uh, is an extraordinary success. It's the strongest law for protecting biodiversity ever passed by any nation. Its purpose is to present, prevent the extinction of our most at-risk plants and animals and to recover them to the point where the Act's protections are no longer needed. Currently, the Act protects more than 1,400 plant and animal species in the United States and its territories, many of which are successfully recovering. All of the species that you see on your screen right now are either recovered or on their way to recovery, and the ESA, and in some cases ESA litigation, has played an important role in ensuring that these and other species get the protection that they need. So in my brief talk, I want to make essentially two points. The first is that litigation can promote species recovery. I'm not saying it's always the most efficient or even the best way to get things done, but over the life of the ESA, it has been a critical tool for getting species the protections that they need and on the road to recovery. And the second point that I want to make is that litigation is essentially about enforcement. 
uh, at least it's about the way uh, the litigants believe that the law should be enforced. And so when we have a debate about litigation, uh, it's important to bear in mind whether we're actually talking about litigation itself as a tool or whether we're having a proxy discussion about whether we are still committed to the goals of the Act. Next slide, please. Now, of course, not all litigation is created equal, but I want to provide a little context and talk briefly about the kind of litigation that we do and why we do it. Uh, a lot of litigation is brought under Section 4 of the Act, and it deals with uh, listing in critical habitat. Uh, these include deadline suits. Of course, as you, most, many of you probably know, the Endangered Species Act requires that the service issue both 90-day and 12-month findings uh, whenever it has uh, received a petition to list the species. And it must then publish a final determination threatened, endangered, or not warranted within another year. And the Act also calls for critical habitat uh, to be designated generally at the time of listing. And these cases are important because, generally speaking, if a species isn't listed, it's not going to be protected. And studies have shown that species, uh, once they're put on the list, um, a lot of them on the list are recovering, uh, that species with critical habitat are more likely to be recovering than those without. Um, and for a long period of time, the service essentially wrote the critical habitat provisions out of the Act, despite the uh, emphasis that Congress had placed on protecting habitat for species, because habitat loss is the number one driver of, of a species decline. But there's another section of Section 4 litigation uh, that is more, I would say, substantive, and that deals with whether the service made the right call uh, in listing a species as threatened or endangered or uh, deciding that the species uh, did not require uh, federal protection at this time. And we're seeing new litigation that is going to evaluate and help flesh out uh, whether uh, there is a duty to conserve under Section 4D, which applies to threatened species, and what the scope of those conservation protections should be. And of course, we also see substantive challenges to critical habitat designations, focusing on what the scope of the designation should be and whether certain areas should be excluded. And the pictures there are two species that I am currently involved in litigation. One is the dune sagebrush lizard, and of course, the other is the lesser prairie chicken. The service declined to list the dune sagebrush lizard on the basis of uh, a series of uh, state conservation agreements uh, by Texas and New Mexico, and yet uh, uh, in the other case, the service did go ahead and list the species as threatened. Next slide, please. Section 7 is another uh, verdant area for litigation. Uh, Section 7A1 uh, provides that uh, all federal agencies must use their authorities in furtherance of the ESA by carrying out programs uh, to conserve endangered and threatened species. And Section 7A2, which is really the meat of it, and some courts have described as the, the heart of the ESA, requires that all federal agencies ensure that uh, any action authorized, funded, or carried out by the agency will not jeopardize the continued existence of the species. This is really very simple. If, an, if a federal action is going to affect a species, uh, the agency needs to consult with the expert wildlife agencies. It is absolutely amazing how often this does not happen. So one way to reduce Section 7 litigation would be uh, simply to have uh, federal agencies actually go ahead and uh, uh, consult. Uh, particularly the EPA, uh, the Pesticide Division, and the Army Corps of Engineers are repeat offenders uh, moving forward with projects where there's no consultation. Uh, when biological opinions are prepared after consultation, there may be additional litigation over the scope and uh, content of uh, those opinions. So that can result in substantive challenges as well. Next slide, please. Section 9 and Section 10 also uh, provide a different type of litigation. Uh, some uh, can focus on uh, trying to stop a direct or indirect take of species. Uh, we have also seen a number of cases uh, that uh, attempt to assign a vicarious liability uh, when uh, uh, governments issue uh, uh, permits for activities that have the effect of taking species. Uh, there you see, um, and I should have pointed out my last slide, that the pictures there were of the, actually we'll go back, can you go back just one second? To the last slide. There we go. There's our snail daughter uh, that you may remember uh, from the, the seminal case of uh, TVA v. Hill, and that's Ollie Houck, professor down at Tulane, who was the litigant in that case. Uh, and of course, that, that TVA v. Hill case uh, really uh, set uh, the bar for uh, the duty to consult um, uh, for species. If you want to go back forward now, that'd be great. 
So as I was saying, though, here we have the whooping crane, uh, which was the subject of a case in the Fifth Circuit last year uh, brought by a group called the Aransas Project uh, that challenged uh, a series of uh, actions and water diversions in the state of Texas that had uh, the effect of uh, reducing water that was available to the whooping crane in the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. Um, below that uh, is a loggerhead turtle, and that's a reference to uh, the loggerhead uh, sea turtle case, uh, loggerhead turtle versus the Volusia County in Florida, where a court found that uh, a town's beach lighting ordinance had the effect of taking endangered species. Let's move on. So very briefly, uh, and this chart could be updated, but I, I wanted to show you uh, the degree of uh, species that have been listed each year uh, from 1974 to the present, and, and the bars would be a little bit higher for the last few years because of the MDL settlement. You'll see uh, that in the earlier days of the Act, there was a lot less litigation over listings, and then starting about 1990 or so, a lot more uh, associated with uh, litigation. and. Uh, uh, also, the pace of listings has increased as the number of species petitioned for listing has also increased. Next slide. So Lisa mentioned the multi-district litigation settlements. Defenders wasn't part of that. Um, as many of you may know, uh, this was the result of a series of cases brought by Wild Earth Guardians and the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, after a, a bit of negotiation, uh, the court entered an order uh, settling those cases in 2011, uh, requiring 90-day findings and 12-month findings and up-and-down decisions uh, for the 250 species that were on the candidate list, as well as some 600 other species that had been petitioned. The agreement runs through April 2017, but there have been some extensions granted. Uh, and if you'll go to the next slide. It's had quite an impact so far. Uh, the backlog under the candidate list uh, where some species had languished uh, with findings that they deserve protection but were not actually going to get it due to other agency priorities uh, has, has finally started to come down. Uh, back in 2011, there were 251 species on the candidate list. Uh, now we are down to 60 species on the list, which is the shortest um, and smallest number of species since the 1970s. Next slide, please. So is the MDL a good thing? Well, the Fish and Wildlife Service has actually said um, it is. Uh, the MDL settlements, and these are all uh, Dan Ash's own words uh, from testimony that he gave uh, before Congress a couple of years ago. He noted that the MDL settlements have accomplished our objectives of making listing activities more certain and predictable and allowing the, circus to, uh, the service to more, uh, more effectively focus its limited resources. Uh, he also noted that uh, it has served to reduce the amount of deadline litigation. In fact, uh, it had decreased by about 96% in, um, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, litigation brought for missed deadlines on petition findings. Uh, it had uh, provided, as I think at least alluded to, some predictability for stakeholders and local communities. Uh, prior to the settlement agreements, many stakeholders were kind of in limbo when you had a species that was petitioned, but you didn't know if it was ever going to be acted on. Uh, now, uh, because of the, the, the fact that there are deadlines for some of these species to be put on the list, stakeholders you know, know in advance, sometimes even years in advance, uh, when those species petitions will be uh, reviewed and when a listing could occur. And so that has had the effect of encouraging proactive conservation efforts by landowners and industry groups and states and local communities. Um, and we've seen that uh, in a number of instances, including uh, the dunes lizard, the greater sage grouse, and the lesser prairie chicken, just to name a few. Next slide, please. These are just a couple of the listing decisions that were made in 2015. Uh, the northern long-eared bat, the roof of red knot, which I petitioned, uh, the black pine snake on the top, um, the uh, uh, down on the second level are three species that were found not warranted for listing, including the greater sage grouse and the New England cottontail and the American eel. And there were even a few species in 2015 that were delisted, uh, including the white-haired goldenrod, uh, modoc sucker, domalva fox squirrel, and the Oregon chub. Next, page, next slide, please. So the second point that I wanted to, to make is, is really that litigation is enforcement and that Congress in its wisdom, not only for the ESA, but for most of our environmental laws and many of our civil rights laws, saw fit to empower citizens to act as private attorneys general to enforce the law. 
And this was for a number of reasons. Uh, first, uh, the government can't be everywhere. It doesn't know what's going on often in the, uh, on the ground. Um, the level of enforcement necessary to make uh, the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act or the ESA effective you know, can exceed the government's capacity. Uh, and so citizens are, are, are watchdogs for making sure that the act is actually being followed. Uh, it also is a backstop for those periods of time when the government simply doesn't want to enforce the law, which unfortunately happens a lot. Uh, and we've seen periods of time where various administrations have refused to list species at all. We've had lots of debates over whether critical habitat should be designated, uh, whether agencies want to go forward with, with Section 7 consultation, whether they're going to comply with biops that have been released. Uh, all of these things are, are persistent uh, problems uh, that citizen enforcement is, is uh, intended to help address. And you also remember that uh, the original Endangered Species Act in 1973 did not uh, contain the deadlines for ensuring that listings are done um, within 90 days and 12 months. That was added specifically by Congress in later amendments, in the, I think it was 1982 amendments, uh, to make sure that the deadlines would be met and that the act would be followed. And so citizen enforcement plays a very important role in all of that. Next slide, please. I don't want to take too much time to other speakers, but I just have a couple more points to make, and that is one of the species that I've been involved with pretty much my entire career has been the piping plover, and it is one that has been frequently litigated. Uh, in 1996, the defenders brought a lawsuit that led to the designation of a wintering critical habitat uh, for the piping plover uh, on the Atlantic coast. That was challenged by a, uh, a group of uh, off-road vehicle users that call themselves the Cape Hatteras uh, Access Preservation Alliance, or CHAPA. They argued essentially that the government did not uh, properly explain the designation and uh, did secure remand in 2004. Uh, the service went back and reissued the rule after adding a little bit more verbiage to it uh, and making a few tweaks to the to the acres that were included in 2008. They sued again, uh, and that lawsuit failed. Uh, while that was going on, uh, Defenders and Audubon sued the National Park Service uh, in 2008 after laboring for a couple of years to try to get the Park Service to develop an off-road vehicle uh, management plan for Cape Hatteras National Seashore. Now. This is something that has been uh, a component of a lot of national seashores since President Nixon ordered the National Park Service to ensure that there are ORV management plans that protect the natural resources of national seashores. Um, you know, way back in the early 1970s, uh, the executive order was modified and reemphasized by President Carter. Uh, in the late 70s, and for 30 years, uh, the National Park Service did absolutely nothing at Cape Hatteras uh, to the uh, detriment of uh, species that nest on the beaches. Uh, it took litigation uh, that led to a consent decree and a negotiated rulemaking process, and finally, uh, we got uh, a plan on the ground that provides habitat for nesting piping plovers and sea turtles and also designates routes and areas for recreational uses uh, and vehicle use for those who want to enjoy the seashore that way. Uh, again, it's something that probably would not have occurred without litigation. And I just point out that Cape Lookout National Seashore, a little bit to the south of Hatteras, uh, still has not done its plan, but they're working on one, so we'll have to wait and see um, uh, when they come into compliance with the law. Next slide, please. And so for my last couple points, I just want to note that the Endangered Species Act passed the Senate in 1973 by a vote of 92 to nothing and the House by 355 to 4. Uh, all of our environmental laws were passed by wide margins, uh, and it was understood that at the time that, that conservation is a conservative value. So when we talk about litigation, we, we can certainly talk about whether there are better and more efficient and less contentious ways to implement the ESA. Um, but too often I fear that the litigation debate is really about uh, enforcement and it raises the question of whether we are uh, still committed to this law, uh, which still enjoys widespread support from the American people. I mean, certainly to be sure, the magnitude of the challenge uh, has increased. There are more species on the list. There are many more that probably should be listed. We're in the midst of what they call the sixth extinction and climate change threatens what one scholar has called a no analog future. Uh, so our work is harder, but the issue is not litigation. Uh, it's our commitment uh, to species recovery. Last slide, or next slide. And each of these species are uh, 
species that were subject to constitutional challenge to the very notion of federal protection of endangered species. The six on the left, uh, the delta smelt, arroyo toad, Alabama sturgeon, red wolf, deli stands flower, loving fly, and cave invertebrates, uh, all passed the test in respective district and circuit courts. The case that's going on now in the 10th Circuit concerns the Utah prairie dog. So again, the fundamental issue here is not so much whether there's litigation or not, but uh, whether we are uh, committed to uh, the cooperative uh, preservation of endangered species uh, with uh, federal and state and personal involvement. And the final slide. So uh, since I'm the one plaintiff's representative on, on the panel, uh, I, I just think it's important to stress that we, we do this work because we, we believe in it, uh, because we think it's not right to leave our children to diminished earth. Um, and we, that's, that is why we do it and, and why we bring this and we think that it's made a difference over the 30, uh, almost 45 years now uh, that the Act has been um, in effect. Thank you. Jason, thank you very much. Uh, as, as Jason observed, the, the pace of litigation picked up significantly in the late 80s uh, and perhaps that was, was uh, foreshadowed by litigation over whether or not the Northern Spotted Owl deserved a spot on the endangered species list. It is perhaps not a coincidence uh, that the listing litigation to which Jason referred uh, preceded the candidate conservation efforts that Lisa referred to in her earlier remarks. I think our next panelist may have some observations um, in, in those regards and, and might even uh, claim to be a plaintiff's litigant himself um, <clears throat> in some cases. Doug Wheeler has an environmental practice focusing on regulatory issues, including endangered species, wetlands, and watershed management, but that doesn't capture uh, what Doug has done or who he is. Um, he has had uh, lifetime professional involvement in endangered species conservation uh, and has served in a variety of distinguished capacities. From 1991 to 1999, he was California's Secretary for Resources, a thankless job from my perspective. Uh, he was a member of the governor's cabinet. And in that capacity, uh, he was responsible for all of the state's natural and cultural resource programs uh, implemented through 18 departments and various other organizations with a total staff of 13,000 people. Uh, Doug joined the Department of Interior uh, before that actually, served for seven years as Assistant Legislative Counsel and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fish, Wildlife and Parks. His experience has also included serving as senior executive for a variety of environmental and conservation organizations, including the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the American Farmland Trust, the Sierra Club, and the World Wildlife Fund. He's a visiting lecturer at Duke University of Law, speaks and writes frequently on environmental law and policy issues. Doug, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be uh, with the group. Good morning, everyone, and let me apologize First of all, for not having slides uh, to accompany my discussion, this discussion this morning, I'm on the road away from a computer, but, but did want to join the discussion. And I thank uh, WGA, uh, Mike, uh, and, and Governor Mead for uh, this important initiative, which emphasizes, and, and this is the point I'd like to make uh, very uh, sharply, uh, emphasizes the importance of the role of states, which has come to mean, uh, in my case, uh, at least in California and the experience that I've had both in the federal and the state uh, government arena on these issues, uh, it has come to mean that the states, as Lisa said, have taken important initiatives which uh, I think we have so far failed to fully recognize, at least in the context of uh, ESA litigation and ESA legislation. I mean, let me just summarize uh, that long trajectory of a career that has uh, been focused on the ESA since uh, I was a young attorney at the Department of the Interior. Uh, to say that as uh, we've already heard TVA v. Hill uh, marked for all time uh, the fact that the Endangered Species Act was perhaps more significant uh, in its many uh, implications than was first recognized at the time of its being debated in the Congress when, as Jason said, it enjoyed a broad majority support. And it's litigation that has really caused uh, the Endangered Species Act to be more pervasive and in some cases more effective uh, than was, uh, I think, anticipated at the time of its being drafted and debated. In fact, uh, I was a young attorney then uh, at the Department of the Interior in, in 1973, uh, recognized that none of us involved with 
the preparation of the act and its uh, consideration by the Congress understood it to have the far-reaching implications uh, that it has now been seen to have as a result of litigation. That may be a good thing or not. Uh, it is the fact that we have problems today in, in wildlife management that are associated with attempts to force fit uh, much of what Jason has said are our legitimate objectives uh, into the framework of a, a somewhat inadequate uh, Endangered Species Act. Uh, but I do recognize that over the time that uh, uh, these acts have been, this act has been considered and amended, uh, we've made some attempts to, to bring it more into line with what uh, contemporary conservation biology suggests uh, is our role in managing the resource. I credit uh, John Leshy, who's on this panel, uh, with many of the innovations which made the act in the 80s and since uh, much more workable. Uh, we should uh, acknowledge that Section 10 is really a pivotal, a pivotal provision in that it enables the issuance of uh, incidental take statements accompanied by habitat conservation plans and permits uh, accompanied by HCPs. That uh, was the first incentive toward uh, collaborative planning for multiple species in ways that the prescriptive provisions of the ESA uh, would not have, have made possible. So uh, an important turning point which led uh, to the fact that today there are 700 uh, HCPs across the country, uh, many of them involved in collaborative efforts by state and the federal government, uh, local practitioners and, and landowners. All, all to the good, but uh, evidence, I think, of the fact that the act itself and litigation under the act have failed to keep pace with important uh, changes not the least of which, as I said a moment ago, uh, is the, the initiative of states that uh, I knew for a fact uh, back in the 90s in California and which Lisa has uh, underscored with regard to the Colorado experience. So this brings us ultimately, I think, to the realization that WGA has an important role to play in prescribing uh, a new relationship uh, which takes into account the initiative of the states and the fact, uh, undisputable fact, that the states themselves are now much more aggressive with regard to species protection and habitat management than the federal government and have larger capacity uh, to undertake those efforts, which are not unfortunately recognized uh, despite Section 6 of the Endangered Species Act, which, which provides that role uh, for the states. Let me just talk briefly about uh, the role of litigation in causing the Fish and Wildlife Service to act responsibly in the discharge of its responsibilities. Uh, Jason talked a lot about uh, the ways in which the act uh, is being implemented through litigation uh, to force uh, individuals or landowners to comply with its provisions, uh, all to the good in some cases, as I said. But in our litigation concerning the application of the peace criteria, uh, we found, and the courts have now agreed, that the Fish and Wildlife Service simply failed to live up to the promise of the cooperative conservation that it espouses, uh, at least uh, nominally. And, and for those who don't know, the lesser prairie chicken was the subject of an unprecedented five-state collaborative uh, called the Western uh, uh, WAY, we call it WAFWA, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies Program uh, to protect 10 million acres of focal areas, a concentrated habitat of high value, uh, two million acres of uh, connective tissue, if you will, uh, to provide migration corridors between those focal areas uh, with an enormous investment, uh, not just by the uh, sponsors of the program, those five states in which there is lots of prairie chicken habitat, uh, but by participating uh, private landowners. We had, uh, and I'm representing a uh, trade association of oil and gas producers uh, in this matter, we had every expectation that that unprecedented effort uh, would be recognized by the Fish and Wildlife Service in making a listing decision with regard to the lesser prairie chicken. Uh, and when it listed, uh, notwithstanding this extraordinary conservation effort, perhaps the most aggressive of its kind uh, undertaken to that point, uh, we were astounded, quite frankly, because it, it, it appeared quite clearly to contradict the policy of uh, peace, which is for the assessment of uh, conservation efforts in advance of listing decisions. Uh, in fact, uh, there were only two really important issues 
to be resolved. One, whether in fact the plan as proposed uh, would be effective if implemented, and second, if uh, whether it would in fact be implemented. And in on that side, and the, and the Fish and Wildlife Service itself had said uh, in the course of its review that yes, indeed, this was a full uh, throated program likely to succeed if implemented uh, to protect the species going forward without need of listing. And then second, uh, with uh, regard to whether it would be implemented, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service simply failed to look ahead to uh, the implications of the program and the commitments that had already been made. Uh, the court found that they were uh, at fault for failing to do that uh, and have delisted the lesser prairie chicken, again, because of the failure of the Fish and Wildlife Service itself to follow important provisions uh, of the Endangered Species Act uh, and implementing regulations. Uh, let me just uh, close by saying we've been talking a lot about uh, various provisions of the Act and the way in which they have been litigated and the implications of that litigation. Uh, the Act and, and the, the litigation about its provisions are by definition prescriptive uh, and retrospective. Uh, we have learned over the 45 years now of our experience with the Act, uh, and I'm happy to have been involved in virtually every one of those, uh, that in fact the most effective approaches and those which we see now coming to the fore even at the federal level were not contemplated by the ESA. And I, I'm uh, the first to say maybe that uh, with, with regard to a landscape uh, scale uh, conservation uh, or mitigation of the kind reflected in the President's recent policy or attempts at ecosystem management, incentives for pre-listing conservation, all of these uh, and advanced mitigation, all of these uh, newer and more uh, nuanced approaches uh, are not embodied in the Endangered Species Act and will not be resolved or promoted, as I believe they should be, uh, through resort to litigation. So th there's a need now to, to look uh, at different tools, and I think foremost among those tools is the kind of cooperative uh, relationship uh, among states, uh, landowners, and the federal government that we saw in the decision uh, with regard to the sage grouse, which uh, at variance with its actions under the lesser prairie chicken, the Fish and Wildlife Service did find it to be effective, did look forward, and did conclude that it was likely to be protective of the uh, species and its habitat. Doug, thank you Mike, very that's much. That's it for the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, appreciate those comments, and thanks for calling in from uh, from out on the trail. Our next and last panelist um, is John Leshy. Uh, his introduction has had somewhat of a drum roll, uh, started by Doug, uh, I'm, I'm sure John is comfortable with. Uh, John is a professor of law at UC Hastings. Um, but that, from many perspectives, is, is the least of the things he's done, at least for mine, with regard to his contributions to conservation. He served as the solicitor of the Department of Interior throughout the Clinton administration. Prior to that, he served as a law professor in Arizona State, uh, but that was, pre was uh, preceded by working at the Interior Department during the Carter administration when he served as special counsel to the chair uh, and, and service as special counsel to the chair of the Committee on Natural Resources within the House of Representatives. He also uh, worked with the Natural Resource Defense Council in California. Uh, before he got into species conservation, his career started as a civil rights division litigator at the Department of Justice. John has served as transition coordinator at the Department of Interior. In 2013, Defenders of Wildlife gave him their Legacy Award for Lifetime Contributions to Wildlife Conservation. He's dabbled as a law professor at Harvard Law, uh, perhaps in revenge from graduate for graduating from there in 1969. Uh, he has both a law degree and a, and a bachelor's from Harvard. He's broadly, uh, broadly uh, published, and John, it's a, an honor to have you on the panel. And if your phone's on uh, mute. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Mike, and uh, thank you, Doug, for the kind words. Um, I, I've been in this business almost as long as Doug. Uh, we date back to about the same time, actually, uh, and I've had the pleasure to work with Doug uh, over the years, and, and I must say he was much too complimentary about my role in the Clinton administration working on the ESA. Uh, what he did in California um, uh, working for Governor Wilson was uh, actually quite path-breaking, and we had the opportunity to work together. Um, 
the ESA, uh, let me also say uh, as an introduction that uh, I uh, thank the WGA, like the other panelists, uh, for putting this together. Um, it is an important task, and it's a task that requires ongoing attention, that is living with the ESA and, uh, and its evolution. Uh, the ESA, uh, you know, I've, as well as I'm sure the other panelists have worked with dozens of statutes, federal and state, of all kinds. Uh, I think without question the ESA is the most challenging statute um, out there in the natural resources world and probably the most impactful. Uh, it, this is very complicated stuff. Uh, the ESA has a, an enormous uh, challenge to uh, uh, work effectively. and. Uh, and when you think that it uh, was basically put in place more than 40 years ago and has only had a couple of significant legislative tweaks since, it's, it's kind of amazing that it has survived uh, as long as it has. And one of the messages, I think, is that the, the statute is uh, somewhat more flexible than most people think um, in terms of how it can be implemented. And it's and its implementation has evolved over the years, in part by litigation. Um, you know, we lost Justice Scalia last week. Justice Scalia wrote an opinion in a case in 1997 that actually had quite an enormous impact on the ESA. And I'm not talking about the snail darter, and I'm not talking about uh, the Sweet Home case. I'm talking about Bennett versus Speer, uh, where uh, Justice Scalia basically, I think, kind of rewrote the ESA to open the door to litigation brought by the regulated community, basically saying that everybody can sue to enforce the ESA, whether you are trying to enforce it from a standpoint of protecting species or whether you're trying to enforce it from the standpoint of uh, sort of minimizing the burdens of regulation to comply with the ESA. So that really uh, does underscore an important point, which I think is that litigation really serves everybody. Um, and the doors are open to everybody to challenge uh, ESA implementation, uh, whether you're trying to make it tougher or make it more lenient. And uh, and so uh, uh, litigation is a, a kind of a two-edged sword and, uh, and does, on the whole, I think, uh, the track record is that it has made the statute work um, somewhat better, probably, than it otherwise would. So uh, as uh, uh, Mike and uh, Doug noted, I'm, I'm, like Doug, a kind of in the category of grizzled, uh, heavily scarred veteran of many ESA battles going back to the snail daughter and spotted owl and the uh, coastal gnat catcher with Doug and, and others. And um, uh, it's, it's a very difficult uh, statute to work with, but um, there are some good things that can be done uh, going forward, and that's why I think the WGA initiative is, is pretty interesting. I, I guess my general caution uh, is that there is no magic wand. Uh, there is no sort of quick fix. There are no specific tweaks that you can make to the statute that would make everything work really, really well. Uh, it's just not the nature of the beast. It's not the nature of the problem. And it's not the nature of ESA politics. And I do want to say a bit of word about that, because I think that colors how we all should think about the ESA. Um, I'm a veteran of a couple of very serious attempts to to tweak the ESA legislatively and make it work better. Um, I spent a lot of time in the mid-1990s working with four, uh, two uh, bipartisan senators, uh, two Republicans, two Democrats, to uh, try to come up with some ESA reforms. Um, we ultimately failed. I served on a task force that the Keystone Institute put together in the early 2000s that was, again, trying to come up with some tweaks that would uh, fix the ESA, make it work better. Uh, that also failed. Uh, the, the politics are, are very difficult, in part because people concerned about the ESA uh, are from all across the political spectrum and sometimes some very odd ways. Um, you know, the ESA issues can divide environmentalists, uh, particularly between sort of environmental protection advocates and sportsmen, uh, animal rights activists, uh, elements of the evangelical right uh, believe, some of them believe devoutly in protecting all species in God's creation and, and split from others. So the politics of the ESA are just very, very challenging. And um, uh, there's a good reason why it has really not been amended hardly at all in, in the 40 years of its uh, existence. Um, the, um, uh, 
There's no question that litigation has affected the statute's implementation in pretty fundamental ways, but I think, as, and Jason was kind of getting to this, you must divide the litigation world under the ESA into two parts. One is listing and listing-related litigation, mostly deadline-driven, and the other is everything else. And they're quite different in terms of their impact and their challenges, and I think we, we, we shouldn't lump all litigation together. I think we have to ask what kind of, of litigation. Um, and that is an important point. Um, how litigation has affected uh, the working relationships of environmentalists and states and the regulated community. Um, certainly it has been on occasion divisive and bitter, but there are also some pretty amazing success stories out there where collaboration and cooperation has, has uh, um, really worked. And so I think we should not lose sight of that as well. And uh, perhaps I said enough in my time with it, and I'll stop here and look forward to questions. Thank you. John, thank you very much, um, and, and thanks to all the panelists for providing a, a remarkably comprehensive overview of, of uh, the manners in which litigation has played an integral part and perhaps affected both the understanding and the implementation of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, I'd like to start off by um, by raising a question that one of our, our audience participants put on the table. Uh, which, which reflects the fact that the Endangered Species Act uh, commonly, I think, perhaps is seen as uh, directing human behavior and, and as an attempt to address uh, the impacts of, of clear human activities on uh, T&E species. But in its implementation, the Act requires uh, the service to consider the effects to species of trends that are not perhaps anthropogenic in nature. Uh, or at least not so clearly anthropogenic in nature. Um, one of our audience has asked, has, has noted that there's uh, increasing evidence about a rapidly changing climate um, and, and asks the following questions. Uh, how does this new information impact decision making under the Endangered Species Act? Uh, and does the Endangered Species Act as contemplated allow or perhaps recognize that uh, it is possible that some species might not survive impacts of climate change. I think that question can be taken beyond climate change per se, but I'd be interested in the panelists' thoughts on that topic. So I'm going to throw the floor, throw it open to the panelists. If any of you want to jump into that, please speak up. I'll go ahead and jump in there, Mike. Um, this is Lisa Reynolds. Um, one thing that we've experienced here, uh, I mean, obviously, people have presumably been following the, the polar bear litigation um, and some of the, the other sea ice affected species, but down in Colorado, um, what we've seen is a change in the way that Fish and Wildlife designates critical habitat and um, a, a tendency to be looking ahead and anticipating where habitat is going to be located um, after some of the impacts of climate change have taken place. So um, areas that are currently unsuitable but are thought to be likely to be suitable in the future or need to be reclaimed so that they're available in the future um, has been a, a one impact that we've really noticed and dealt with here. This is Jason. I guess if I could follow up on that, um, I think that's a very good point. Critical habitat is that habitat which is considered to be essential to the conservation of the species. Uh, that may, you know, in the past, we've always thought of that as uh, both the habitat where uh, the species currently exists and um, some portion of its historic range to which it is, is still uh, suited. But the service will need to put increasing emphasis on uh, corridors and on broader uh, uh, habitat change uh, that it anticipates in order to ensure that uh, what is essential to the conservation of the species is uh, still available to it. As far as um, you know, other uh, issues that I think the question raises, I mean, it certainly is now the case that climate change impacts have to be considered not only in evaluating threats to the species at the initial listing decision, but also in the Section 7 consultation. Uh, we're going to be looking at activities, uh, the effects of, of climate change on, on various uh, activities, whether that's sea level rise, um, 
uh, or forest management or what have you. Um, and the second part of your question, I think, from what I see on the screen was, you know, does the ESA allow that some species may not survive the impacts of climate change? And that's a very interesting question. Uh, we could do an entire program probably just on what recovery means. And uh, there are certainly a number of species already, and there may be more in the future, that are what scientists call conservation reliant, uh, and which may not survive without some kind of active management. The Endangered Species Act itself does not uh, contemplate uh, the extinction of, of any species. Uh, it contemplates a path to uh, protecting and recovering them. And whether or not recovery is going to be possible in all instances, of course, is, is, is left open uh, in part to what uh, we have the ability to do and what, uh, you know, what actually will transpire uh, as climate change continues to advance. Jason, Lisa, thank you very much. Um, Doug, John, any, any additional comments you want to add, or shall I tee up uh, our next question? Well, I, I'd only say that, uh, as, as Jason's response suggests, uh, to assume uh, the ability of the Fish and Wildlife Service, or NIMS for that matter, to forecast the implications of climate change is a tall order. And uh, if listing decisions and habitat designations uh, are to proceed on the assumption uh, that they are knowledgeable about the likely effects of climate change or sea level rise is going to give rise to challenges, I think, that we have not yet considered uh, going forward since so there's so much disagreement about uh, the likely effects of climate change. Uh, and I think you're going to see that, incidentally, uh, with regard to the new regs just, just adopted, which uh, give further emphasis on uh, the protection of unoccupied habitat. Again. Uh, reflecting uh, the ability presumed of the Fish and Wildlife Service to make decisions about habitat not yet occupied, but which might be useful to species um, as uh, circumstances dictate. Uh, uh, this is John. Uh, I'll just add one thing. I agree with everything that Jason and uh, Doug and Lisa said. Uh, I would say with regard to climate change, uh, the services are going to have to grapple with this problem. It's going to be very difficult. I expect they will be grappling, you know, for, for several years about this and coming up with ways to uh, anticipate uh, what, to some extent, is not anticipatable. Um, climate change is going to change ecosystems in all sorts of ways we don't understand um, and we'll have a hard time getting to understand. Uh, but. Ways will be developed to deal with it, and uh, at some point, I, I think, I'm safe in making a prediction, at some point Congress is going to have to step in and try to uh, tweak the ESA to make it more, work better with respect to this challenge. Uh, I, that's not going to happen anytime soon. It's, it's, uh, it may be a decade or two away, but uh, ultimately there, were, there are going to have to be some changes to, to make the statute uh, adapt to um, climate change. But don't hold your breath. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the ESA, I, I think, is often regarded, or historically has often been regarded, as, as uh, looking at preservation of the status quo uh, and a limited look forward, uh, but generally looking back at what we had and asking, do we still have it? Uh, I think uh, it's fair to suggest that the, the climate change issues, global warming issues, the listing of the polar bear, uh, among other species, and litigation over that uh, presage an, an evolution in the act into dealing with the anticipating the future uh, and providing for safe havens, if you will, for wildlife, uh, as the panelists have suggested. I think that is an area that is ripe for creativity and thought uh, with regard to opportunities to um, bring the ESA up to date, if you will, uh, and, and into a looking forward exercise. Uh, Probably worth noting that litigated species uh, may serve as surrogates for, and do serve as surrogates for hosts of other species that we do not currently regard as threatened or endangered, but which depend on the same habitats that listed species do. Uh, that may be an example of the utility of litigation and flagging um, events and issues that were unanticipated by the drafters and, and, and uh, folks who passed the ESA as we currently recognize it. I'd like to throw out another question that is aimed uh, perhaps a little more specifically at some of the topics Lisa raised in her initial comments. Um, you know, the 
the obvious topic in in this uh, exercise is how has litigation affected the Fish and Wildlife Service and NIPS uh, administration of the of the ESA uh, more broadly. But uh, one thing I think is important to recognize is that the assertion of federal authority under the Endangered Species Act uh, to some extent displaces um, state authority over wildlife, which is which is the the constitutional norm. Uh, bearing in mind that litigation can involve states as well as uh, members of the public on whatever side of the issue, uh, I'd like the panelists' thoughts on uh, the degree to which ESA litigation has affected the working relationship between the service and uh, NIMFs and state wildlife managers. Uh, I think we should probably include uh, state lands administrators as well. And, and what that means in terms of moving forward particularly as we see evolving focus and increasing focus on collaborative, non-litigative uh, activities. Uh, Lisa, you, I am sure, have some thoughts on this. Uh, would you care to lead off? Sure. I was afraid you were going to ask me that. Um, <laughs> um, certainly the, the, the displacement of state authority over wildlife is a, a huge subject for state wildlife agencies. Um, how litigation has driven that is, you know, it's a little bit complicated because often you'll have a situation where um, the state wildlife agency is doing what it thinks is a good and effective job with conservation and um, a citizen suit or, or a suit from someone else is brought to list a species, um, and perhaps it wasn't even at the initiative of Fish and Wildlife. Fish and Wildlife could well have been the defendant, probably was the defendant in that litigation. Um, and so the outcome of the litigation essentially forces Fish and Wildlife into a role that it may not have sought, but nonetheless um, causes friction between the state and Fish and Wildlife Agency. I have to say, um, you know, there's always there's always friction in this relationship, but we have found that both Fish and Wildlife and some of the other agencies that are involved in recovery, like NRCS, have sought to be good partners um, with us, regardless of the position that they're put in following litigation. So I, I certainly don't think it's the case that litigation has um, damage the relationship, although it often, certainly it complicates it. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Doug, Jason, any any additional thoughts on that? Hey, sure. It's a point, uh, uh, Mike, uh, I'll, I'll defer to Jason in just a minute, but it's a point that uh, was brought home to me in uh, the time that I spent in California, which, which has its own uh, State Endangered Species Act uh, premised on the assumption that this is primarily a state responsibility. And as John points out, we were able to draw an effective line between the authority and the responsibility of the state of California in the case of the California gnat catcher and that of the federal government, um, a partnership that worked uh, very well. We were also able to anticipate uh, the need for ecosystem management or at least habitat-wide management for that species in the coastal sage scrub. Uh, you've got to remember that when the Act was enacted in 1973, uh, it was in part because the states had failed to step forward in meeting their responsibility for the protection of threatened and endangered species. That has changed tremendously uh, in those last 45 years to the point where, as I said earlier, uh, the states are in a much better position now than the federal government to affect uh, protection of indigenous species and, and their recovery owing to the number of tools that are available to them, the financial resources that are available to them, and the, and the willingness of, and this is important, the willingness of private sector partners to work with state governments uh, in preference to the federal government. So what, there is need to look at the reality of Section 6 and to make better use of the tool, which anticipates cooperative agreements between the state and the federal government to achieve their joint objectives. 
Um, so this is Jason. I'll jump in if that's all right. Um, there's no question in my mind that uh, we need to make uh, better use of partnerships in implementing the Endangered Species Act, uh, whether through a Section 6 uh, or through habitat conservation planning. There is a very, very important role uh, for states uh, to play. And uh, Doug's experience in California shows just how effective a state can be when it is willing to commit its uh, resources uh, and attention to species uh, protection. But I, I think I don't share uh, Doug's view that the, the states writ large are in quite as good a position to take on the role of species conservation um, as he suggested. And, and that's simply because uh, California is really very much a rarity uh, of uh, the 41 states that reported their uh, 2012 endangered species spending to the Fish and Wildlife Service. 25 of them spent less than $500,000 on the entire program. 13 spent less than 100,000 and 7 spent less than 50,000. You know, while California spends about 14 or 50 million every year, Kansas spent 32,000 and North Dakota spent 4,000. Um, and that's, that's not enough even for a single biologist. So what, you know, the, the, the degree of ability of the states is going to vary uh, very widely uh, from state to state, all told. You know, the, the federal government spent, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, ESA uh, funding was, was close to $400 million and states uh, combined, of those reported, was more like $63 million. So there's a real gap, uh, and it's not as though uh, the federal government can simply uh, go away uh, and just hand it back over to the states. We'll find ourselves exactly in the same situation we were there before the 1970s. And, and that said, there's a lot of variation uh, among uh, the way uh, states manage species, especially species that cross uh, state borders. Uh, you can look at um, the, the wide varieties uh, in emphasis of management of gray wolves across uh, states ranging from uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota to Wyoming and Oregon and now even California. Uh, very, very different approaches uh, to uh, the protection of that species. A case that I'm litigating and I won't say too, too much about, but the dune sagebrush lizard was uh, uh, li was not listed by the service on the basis of two state management plans, uh, one by the state of New Mexico, uh, which also encompasses lesser prairie chicken habitat and provides fairly uh, rigorous uh, 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 protection mechanisms uh, for landowners who uh, engage uh, in uh, conservation. Uh, they benefit from certificates of inclusion under a candidate conservation agreement. Uh, it's very transparent. Uh, the state of Texas went a completely different route with uh, a plan that uh, does not tell the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, which landowners have enrolled or how they have enrolled uh, or what they've even promised to do, and yet uh, the service viewed those two plans as being essentially uh, equivalent in deciding not to list uh, the species uh, as threatened or endangered. So it's a wide variety, and for those states that are, are able uh, and, and, and willing to participate and cobble together uh, agreements uh, and conservation measures uh, that can really benefit species, uh, that is vital, and we need to see more of it. Let Jason, me just jump in you. one more a word on that, uh, Mike. Uh, I, I certainly agree that uh, the capacity of states and the commitment of states even may vary from place to place, but I think the future is uh, best illustrated by the Wasla plan for the lesser prairie chicken, a combination of, of five states who pooled their resources and who were able, therefore, to devise a plan to protect uh, the species across uh, its entire ecosystem, regardless of state boundaries. This is an important contribution of the states. And I think it's important as WGA looks at the role of states, perhaps as the outgrowth of this uh, project, uh, to consider how we might better encourage those kind of collaborative efforts in which the federal government played a role, in which private landowners played a role, and in which the states provided uh, absolutely essential leadership. Doug, thank you. Um, I, I might make a couple of comments. Uh, I think we are, without a doubt, seeing state conservation efforts um, increasingly dedicated to 
either trying to avoid a listing or as is in the, as in the case of the, the greater sage grouse um, or as providing sufficient conservation to support a delisting effort as as is mm -hmm. the case in the context of the gray wolf um, whether whether the state efforts upon which uh, Fish and Wildlife Service essentially relied in deciding not to list the uh, the sage grouse, uh, which are supplemented, uh, I, it's hard to say supplemented given the amount of money that the Department of Agriculture has devoted to sage grouse conservation, uh, whether those efforts are perceived as adequate um, or or as going too far aside, uh, from my perspective, the collaborative exercise that the sage grouse states and the Department of Interior uh, Forest Service Department of Agriculture have devoted to sage grouse conservation is a remarkable development and it is spurred not by any particular provision of the Endangered Species Act but by mm -hmm. a collective desire to avoid the position of the Endangered Species Act as a regulatory framework um, covering those conservation actions. Uh, that is a, a very significant development. Um, one, one thought to ponder, and then I'll move to the next question I've received from our audience. One thought to ponder is to the extent that the states are stepping up their game either to avoid a listing or provide a basis for, for delisting and, and some confidence that a delisted species will stay off the list, uh, they're incurring costs above and beyond what state wildlife agencies typically enjoy. Uh, their funding sources are quite limited, and I think a parallel effort is underway to consider the degree to which uh, federal funding is appropriate or is not appropriate, depending on your perspective, to support those kinds of state conservation efforts. Uh, I think that that consideration is of uh, real importance uh, going forward with the WGA initiative, uh, because if we want states to do more, every state, every every level of government can can confidently state they don't have enough money to do it. Uh, the appro appropriate allocation of funding between state and federal government in T and E species listing avoidance or delisting, I think is a fair topic for conversation. We have another question, um, and, and, and it really hints at a broader topic, uh, which is the degree to which um, ESA or species-oriented uh, litigation and listing litigation in particular um, is aimed at uh, essentially serving as a proxy to obtain uh, other objectives, whether it be federal land use uh, management um, or with regard to uh, the impacts of particular activities which are regarded as desirable or not desirable. Uh, I'd be interested in the panelists' thoughts on that, both is it, does it happen? Uh, I think that's probably a, an easy one to answer. Um, the second question is, is that altogether a, a, a bad thing? Uh, comments from, from anyone and uh, John, do you want to lead off on this? Because we've we let we've let Jason and Doug lead with their chins a couple of times. And if the answer is no, I'll take something from anybody on the panel. No, uh, I'll take Craig. Well, of course, uh, <laughs> I, I think the word proxy is kind of a loaded term here. <laughs> um, the ESA is designed to protect species and. Often, the way you protect species is you protect habitat. In fact, that's probably the most common way that you protect species. And so it's not a proxy for land use regulation. It actually is just the inevitable result of the way the statute works. It is true, and I think Doug averted this, that in the legislative history of the Act when it was being contemplated in Congress in the early 1970s, uh, the relationship to habitat was not as clearly perceived as it is now. Um, hunting was probably seen as the big threat to many species. Uh, we now know it's, that's, that's actually a, a small threat compared to everything else. So, so uh, I, I don't think it's a proxy. I think that's just the way the statute works. Now, um, some people say that, well, the ESA comes into play only because other statutes that are supposed to protect the environment have failed. Uh, you know, the Clean Water Act doesn't produce water of sufficient quality and quantity to produce, to protect uh, uh, fish species that uh, then become endangered. And if we enforce the Clean Water Act, we wouldn't need an ESA. Uh, that's true to an extent, but, but I think is not completely true. And uh, the ESA is the ultimate backstop, but because the major threats are usually habitat related, it does turn into, to some extent, uh, a regulation of land use. John, thank you. Uh, other comments from the panel? OK, 
Okay. So, um, sorry, is that um, I hear someone? Is that Jason? Is that you? Yeah, that's me. Uh, I mean, I guess the only thing I would add to what John said, uh, you know, when you look directly at the purpose of the act, and it does it does talk very specifically about uh, protecting the, the ecosystems on which threatened and endangered species depend. The only other uh, point that I kind of wanted to, to just bring up, since I'm I'm the only uh, real plaintiffs, uh, I guess I'm the representative of the, of the plaintiffs lawyers, although I know Doug has done, done a number of cases as well, and, and, and as we've heard, uh, you know, states can sue too. Um, but you know, to the extent that there have been studies that look at the amount of litigation that's brought uh, and by whom uh, a very large uh, percent of Endangered Species Act litigation is uh, not brought by um, us uh, tree huggers. A uh, fair amount is brought by uh, industry groups uh, and other other entities. A uh, study in 2006 found that 80 percent of all then active critical habitat litigation was filed by uh, industry groups. And the general accounting, uh, the Government Accountability Office uh, had found in a 2011 report looking at suits against the EPA uh, that 48 percent were filed by industry groups while environmental groups had filed uh, 30 percent. So I think as we've all pointed out at one point or another, there's lots of different kinds of litigation that are involved. And um, while I think litigation has been a real tool for uh, improving the uh, the administration uh, of the act, uh, there's, there's different types of, of cases and clients. Jason, thank you. Uh, one of the topics that, that is, is teed up often and, and the climate change uh, conversation that we've had so far, you know, hints at a, a, uh, an aspect of this. Uh, the Endangered Species Act requires uh, that endangered species conservation listing and conservation actions uh, decision, -making, decision making be based on the best available science. Um, it's it's simple for a non uh scientist to conclude that best available depends on his judgment you're talking to um, that's i think unfair there have been uh substantial efforts devoted by the department of interior and uh in assuring some sort of quality assurance quality control if you will uh with regard to the quality of the scientific information upon which its decisions were based those efforts notwithstanding, uh, best available science-based claims uh, underlie um, many aspects of, of litigation under the Act and, and, and may actually be a, a factor in, in almost all listing uh, litigation. Uh, I'm curious from the panelist's perspective uh, how you would approach the best available science uh, question um, and, and whether there are things that uh, from your perspective could be done uh, to reduce the amount of litigation that is best based on the a best available science claim, whether that's brought by those who think that critical habitat isn't large enough or those who think that critical habitat is too large, just as an example. Uh, I'm also curious as to your observations as to uh, whether there is a benefit to trying to um, address best available science claims with the objective of reducing the flow of litigation on that particular aspect. Uh, I'd like to throw that question up to the to the panel as a whole. Uh, this is John. I'll jump in with uh, three quick points. Um, one is I don't think actually best available science uh, in the statute adds anything to what the Administrative Procedure Act already requires of all federal agencies. That is, they can't be arbitrary and capricious. And if an agency ignores best available science, they're probably going to be arbitrary. So I think this, to say there's something special about the ESA's best available science um, requirement is, is probably not true. Uh, second, I'd say the science question under the ESA is, is actually quite fascinating because some people say it's all about hard science and whatever the scientists say we have to do. But if you actually look at how the act works, it requires a tremendous amount of judgment, uh, judgment that is not driven always by hard science. One of the things you have to do to decide whether to list a species is to weigh the adequacy of existing regulatory mechanisms. Well, that's not a hard scientific judgment. You don't need a biologist to, to, to make that judgment. A biologist can't add anything or, or have any special expertise in that kind of judgment. So, so there's, there is judgment under the ESA that's required that's not always driven by hard science. Now the third point, last point is, uh, 
I think if you look at the decided cases, actually judges don't defer all that much to the scientific judgments of the agencies. I mean, there, there are lots of cases out there where, uh, where the agencies really don't get as much deference on the scientific judgments as you think they might. Uh, so uh, that's where judicial review actually, I think, does uh, and, and litigation can uh, uh, plays kind of a puzzling role in the, in the ESA. I'll stop there. John, John thank Jason. you. Um, Please, I, 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 I think those are really good points um, that John just made, and I, I would just sort of add to them. I mean, when you're looking at listing particularly, you're evaluating not only the status of the species, assuming that you actually know how many uh, uh, members of the population still exist, but you're looking at extinction risk over geography over time. And at the end, a decision often comes down to, um, you know, what you what your level of risk tolerance is. When you look at the definition of a of a threatened species, it's one that's likely to become endangered in a foreseeable future. But what is that? That's not a simply a science question. That that's again goes to a policy judgment about uh, you know what foreseeability means and what level of risk we're willing to accept. Uh, I think uh, uh, John pointed out the adequacy of existing regulatory mechanisms. That's another area uh, in Bennett v. Speer. The, the Supreme Court was clear that the act should not be uh, implemented on the basis of speculation and surmise. And, um, and we talked very briefly before about the, the peace policy and, and how that's played out with, with listings like the dunes lizard and the lesser prairie chicken. Uh, there have been a lot of different court cases around the country that have struck down actions by the service that relied on speculative or unenforceable uh, uh, voluntary uh, mechanisms that, that were not regulatory, regulatory in scope. Uh, and that's that's a real uh, question going forward is, um, you know, what uh, uh, what level of weight should be given to these uh, types of uh, agreements at the end of the day? Those are not science questions. Jason, they require thank you. predictions, to, yeah. Mm -hmm. to, to, to take up a point on that and perhaps Doug, uh, as for your thoughts on it, uh, I think there are a few scientists that would claim the ability to predict the future to an absolute certainty. And to a degree, uh, science and, and climate change is an example is, a, is an exercise that might be regarded as, as one of assessing probabilities and, and the, the likely future. Uh, without jumping into the climate change issue per se, I'm curious, Doug, as to your thoughts as the, to the degree to which that exercise differs, if at all, uh, from projecting the level of participation um, in a species conservation effort, such as, as the two that were on the table in the lesser prairie chicken, is it is it really different, or or are they somewhat uh, somewhat similar, but but with different a uh, different context? Um, it is the case, thank you, uh, it is the case that the Fish and Wildlife Service is asked to use its professional judgment uh, in assessing, as I said earlier, under piece one, whether a program, a collaborative uh, scheme like the WAFWA program uh, is likely to be effective, uh, and that is to some degree a scientific assessment based on what is known about the plan and about its uh, attempt to address uh, threats to species. And then second, if it is likely to be implemented. And that's the one, the second phase, which was at the heart of the judge's decision in, in uh, the Lesser Prairie Chicken case. The Fish and Wildlife Service simply refused uh, to take into account the fact that there was an unprecedented degree of participation in that plan, not just by landowners and the states, by, but by other federal agencies, and would not take into account the cumulative effect of those collaborative actions as projected to protect the species. Interestingly, only a few months later, the Fish and Wildlife Service made those very same projections with regard to the sage grass, and as we know, came to a different uh, conclusion, uh, even though the same elements of collaboration and participation and incentive uh, were involved. Jason is correct. Uh, there had been cases which suggest that there was no need uh, or could not be reliance upon speculative uh, actions uh, as the basis for listing decisions. That is precisely why the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, wrote the peace criteria. The Lesser Prairie Chicken litigation asks, <clears throat> if you write the criteria and they are adhered to, why then are they not being followed by the Fish and Wildlife Service? 
this is Jason. I, I feel like Doug and I could have a good oral argument just right now on the Lester Perry chicken case. It would probably be fun <laughs> for both of us. Um, you know, <laughs> the service predicted that enrollment would increase in the Texas plan for the dune sagebrush lizard, and in fact, since they decided not to list, enrollment has declined. And they've gone before that same judge in Texas and said this was one of the reasons why they listed the Lester Perry chicken, and that the listing is threatened uh, was in part on the basis of the strong consideration of, of the WAFA plan, but that at the end of the day, the species would still be at risk. Uh, in fact, we have seen that elements of the WAFA plan now are not being implemented. The permanent mitigation that had been part of that design has been essentially waived by the Fish and Wildlife Service. So we, you know, these are real, these are real questions, and, uh, um, you know, it will, we, we, we will eventually, I think, come to some agreement about how these sorts of things can go forward, because I do agree with Doug that um, the, the, the WAFA plan, the Greater Sage Grouse, which is a different plan and should be evaluated on its own terms, all these things herald a new way of doing things for endangered species, but we do have to get it right, and we do have to have some standards for what it is that uh, should, you know, be considered good enough uh, that it eliminates the risk to the species such that it does not require listing uh, or protection from uh, the ESA. And, well, and that's, a very that? nice, that's a very nice segue, <laughs> which I'm going to take advantage of as, as hey, moderator's hey, hey. prerogative, to, to turn to our state representative on this panel. Um, I think it's a wonderful observation uh, that there were many elements of both the Lesser Prairie Chicken effort and the Greater Sage Grass uh, effort that were similar. Um, Lisa, as, as counsel to state agencies, um, in looking at those, those case studies out there, uh, do you have any thoughts as to, to how you would advise um, your, your clients with regard to mounting uh, significant initiatives to, to do and accomplish pre-listing conservation to avoid a listing with the, um, the proposed uncertainty as to how the service is going to answer uh, the question, are they enough? Well, um, yes, I'll, let me answer that, but I'm going to jump back really quickly to the science question because I wanted to just share briefly the state's experience in, in that area on a couple of um, different species. We've been a partner with Fish and Wildlife and the other four, uh, four corner, the other three four corner states in working on a recovery program for uh, the Mexican wolf. And one of the key scientific questions that's come up as part of the recovery planning is what the historic range of Mexican wolf was. Was it um, specifically, did it include northern Arizona, northern New Mexico, and into Colorado and Utah or not? Um, and that's a question that you know, requires a lot of modeling, a lot of assumptions, um, and Fish and Wildlife in this particular episode of recovery planning, there have been many for the Mexican wolf, most of them unsuccessful. In this one, Fish has reached out um, and included all four states and specifically asked for state biologists to be the ones participating in these workshops. Um, and they've been open to the science that the states bring to the table. Um, and with respect to other species, gunnison and sage grouse, as I said, we're challenging the listing, but we worked very closely with them because the states have um, resources and expertise and data and monitoring data, um, as well as, you know, our own set of PhD biologists who have opinions about small population size, genetics, inbreeding, um, things like that, and I think that as part of the trend towards a more deliberate incorporation of states into their decision making, um, which is inconsistent, doesn't always happen, but I do think there's a trend, uh, I think Fish and Wildlife is benefiting more from the, the scientific input and using that expertise from the states. Um, and so while we'd love to see more of it, um, I, I do think it's a, it's a promising trend. Um, well, in, in light of the um, uh, the nature of the WJ, WGA initiative, and a number of comments from the audience have have focused on the the degree to which state engagement in 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 T and E species or perhaps uh, candidate conservation is inconsistent. I think Jason made that point, and others. 
Um, it's worth noting, uh, perhaps, that in light, of, in light of John's comment uh, with regard to the flexibility of the Act, many, if not all, of the most significant conservation initiatives, from my perspective, uh, whether you look at the safe harbor uh, policy or you look at the candidate conservation um, agreement policies that Fish and Wildlife Services have adopted, uh, the pre-listing uh, conservation effort and, and, and the services effort to figure out how to and when to recognize pre-listing conservation, uh, are there things, those have all been done without any statutory revision. Are there things that could be done, uh, is there anything that should be done on a statutory level to encourage uh, greater state engagement in the conservation effort along the lines of the, those kinds of initiatives? Um, or do you think that we are best off um, allowing people to explore the flexibility available under the Act uh, without the benefit of congressional advice? Comments from the panel? This, this is Doug, Mike. I'd just say that uh, John has uh, uh, pinpointed the problem here, which is to get a consensus before the Congress and to achieve uh, new legislative direction is, is not an easy thing, and, it, and I don't see it happening uh, anytime soon. But it is the case that we need more clear-cut policy uh, on, on the part of the Fish and Wildlife Service with regard to these partnerships and better incentives uh, to involve the states as they devise cooperative programs. I think Section 6 uh, provides at least uh, underutilized authority to do just that. And I'm hopeful that the WTA exercise will lead to the realization that there's an opportunity here to be pursued, uh, even if there is uh, no prospect of legislation anytime soon. I would totally second that. We have been spending a fair amount of effort looking at Section 6 and trying to figure out um, ways to take better advantage of it. And Section 6 actually reflects um, some, some conflicts, at least in one of the chambers, I think it was the House, um, the House hearings, about how much of a role states should have. And so Section 6 is kind of schizophrenic in that it, it appears to accord states a lot more autonomy than we see in actual practice. Um, but at the end of the section, after proposing to give states this, this autonomy, um, it also inserts a preemption provision that says everything you do has to be at least as strong as the ESA. And the way I think that's played out in practice has been um, a diminution of states' willingness to, to really engage and try to be innovative or take more charge of some of these um, these conservation activities. So I, I think there's a lot of room under Section 6, and it is something that um, we are hoping that, that this initiative will help flesh out as we move forward. Other comments from the panel? Um, I, I would actually agree with Doug. Uh, this is Jason. I think uh, uh, we do you know, need to see uh, some more clear-cut policies and incentives. Uh, Defenders did a report some years ago about um, the promise of uh, Section 6 agreements uh, and uh, how that could move forward. Uh, Section 5 is this whole other area of the Act that nobody ever talks about or thinks about. Uh, there's uh, uh, certainly uh, you know, more, that, more that could be done in that respect, but I don't see anything happening in, in, in this Congress or the next, uh, nor would I want it to at <laughs> this point. <laughs> I started my career in Washington in the early 90s as well, and uh, I was a reporter at that time covering Endangered Species Act issues on the Hill, and you know, had a long chance to sit down with with Dirk Kempthorne and some of the uh, some of the other uh, leaders who were trying to put together uh, some of uh, you know like some advancements for the ESA at that point, and uh, there's just none of that going on really right now uh, constructively in in Washington. Other comments? John, I'll bet you have some ideas on this. 
No, I just I'd second everything that everybody said. Um, you know, the problem is the ESA is incredibly challenging, and it's very difficult stuff. And there are just there's nobody on the hill that's interested in this at this point. I mean, interested in actual you know sort of substantive um, improvements. And so it's a it's um, it's not in the cards in the near future. Having said that, I, the act has proved itself again and again to be like I said at the beginning, more flexible than people think. And so I think that, the, you know, if you want to constructively engage with the federal agencies, uh, they're open to it. And uh, and there are ways, to, you can devise ways to make it work. And so I think that's why this WGA initiative is important and I wish it success. Just don't make legislation the centerpiece of the recommendations. Uh, and that I think is emerging as a as a consensus point from the panel, uh, yeah. which is which is the value of uh, for the WGA initiative exploring the questions that it poses in the context of your ability to pursue them um, through either regulatory or policy development, uh, recognizing that the status quo as far as the statute is concerned um, might might not be to everybody's liking. It might not be to anyone's liking, um, but perhaps the uh, the field of opportunity is on the administrative side. I know I cut someone off. Uh, Jason, was that you? Somebody have further comments? No, I'm good. Okay. Um, Zach, I'll, I'll, I'll check in with you uh, from a process standpoint. I think the the uh, webinar was, was scheduled initially to go to noon. I know we are slightly past that. Um, how would you like to proceed at this point? I think out of respect for everyone's time, we're probably going to wrap it up. Um, we can certainly continue the discussion offline and um, think on some of these questions, but I think just out of respect for everyone, we should probably wrap things up. I would like to then um, uh, reflect a, 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 a late question coming in from the audience, perhaps as a good note to close on. Uh, Namely, uh, can state and conservation NGOs support an increase in funding of collaborative conservation efforts? Uh, I think that has both state and federal budgetary implications. Uh, everybody always thinks that somebody else has more money than they need that can be put to the uses we desire. Mm. But I think as a practical matter, the federal agencies implementing the Endangered Species Act, NIMFS and Fish and Wildlife in particular, are increasingly being asked to do more with mm -hmm. less. Mm -hmm. um, there may be a limit to what we can accomplish uh, in pursuing process efficiencies. Uh, I think that some of the questions that have been put on the table um, fairly raise budgetary issues. Um, and I think there's, there, there's a general recognition that as long as we have a statute in place that requires decision making, and I'm thinking particularly the Section 7 uh, uh, piece of it, um, you need somebody there to make the decision. So a federal action can move forward, and, and sometimes I think that's overlooked uh, on the appropriation side. With that, I want to thank uh, the audience first and foremost uh, for joining us. Uh, we had a large audience, uh, received excellent questions. Um, but I really want to thank the, the panelists. The, the wealth of your experience and, and breadth of your backgrounds and perspectives is, um, is really impressive. This is a conversation that an ESA nerd like myself could happily have uh, and listen to for several days. We don't have that luxury. Thank you very much for giving us your time and thoughts today. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. It was a real pleasure, and I want to thank the uh, uh, Western Government Association for putting this on and uh, engaging uh, in, in these kinds of discussions. Thanks, everyone. And Thanks, Mike. I would 100% I would echo everything you said. We probably could have gone on with this webinar for many more hours, but um, unfortunately we could not. So again, I just want to thank everyone for attending and thank all the panelists. Again, this has really been a great discussion, very informative, uh, very helpful for WGA, and hopefully helpful for all those out there or interesting. Um, 
a few housekeeping items before we close up. Um, please look for a wrap-up email coming to all webinar attendees that should come early next week with a link to the webinar recording on YouTube and a summary of some of the key discussion points brought up today. And also, please be sure to visit westgov.org to see some of the case studies, best practices, and resources that have been published as a result of this initiative. And also, you can check out information for future webinars on our website and also um, get the registration link for those. So I would urge everyone to check that out. Um, and with that, I think I will close. Thank you again, everyone.